Hello my K116 students. This video is for 22nd July Wednesday. So I'm gonna pick up where I left off in the last class. In the last class, what we are started talking about is something called microstates. Now, if you are wondering why do we care about microstate, because we said that side energy that we had talked about, right? How we had said that most of the time the exothermic processes are spontaneous in chemistry, but there were some exceptions. Since endothermic and exothermic processes involve exchange of energy, exchange of energy, all right? What I said was there was another factor that can determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. And the other factor, we termed it as entropy. And in layman's term, what entropy is, is basically how ordered or disordered a system is. Meaning that if a system is more disordered, means it has a higher entropy, all right? And then we used a formula called S equals to K, L, and W, where S is the term we use to denote entropy, as K is the Boltzmann constant that will be provided to you, whereas W is the number of microstates that's possible. And what I have said about microstates is basically uh, in how many different configuration can you, let's say, load the particle in the box. That's what w tells you and we can calculate w by the formula n to the power n where n is the number of boxes and if you're wondering what are the number of boxes that i've been talking about it's these boxes right for this example that i told you today there are two boxes and that's what number of boxes mean and this capital n refers to the number of particles that is in that particular system all right, so this is how we can find the number of microstates. And then I told you to ignore this example because this is not properly shown, but this example as to what microstate means is shown really carefully, very nicely, not carefully. So basically what is done in this process, in this example is they have four particles and they are trying to arrange those four particles in the two boxes. And each of those arrangements, if you want to call it, or configuration, if you want to call it, is termed a microstate, right? So this is one, one microstate, two microstate, three microstate, four microstate, five microstate, and so on. So if you count the number of microstates, we came to a number of to the power four equals to 16, because two was the number of boxes, four was the number of particles. And if you count the number of microstates here, there are 16 configurations that are possible. Right. And on the important thing where I stopped yesterday was each of these A, B, C, we termed those as distribution. All right. So what is distribution is basically microstates with equivalent particle arrangement. All right. So basically this is one distribution because this distribution has three particles in box one and then one particle in box two. That's why these are all equivalent. If you look at distribution C, distribution C has two particles in box one and two particles in box two. So I hope these terms, microstates and distribution, you are comfortable with now because in the exam, there will definitely be a pictorial problem that is going to ask you this concept of microstate, number of microstates, and distribution. All right. Now the question is, why did I do the microstates? First thing, because we said that entropy depends upon the number of microstates, right? W. That's why since W can determine the entropy of the system, that's why we're calculating the number of microstates. Now, based on this pictorial, can we determine if any of these configurations is most probable or not, right? The question that I'm asking you is, you have five distributions, right? One, first distribution, 
second distribution, third distribution, fourth distribution, fifth distribution. Out of the five distributions, which one do you think is most probable? That's the question I left, ended the yesterday's PowerPoint with. And then if you went ahead and looked at it, look at this. Basically, the distribution, which has the largest number of microstates, is going to be the most probable one and the most probable distribution will have the greatest entropy basically this is what you're supposed to write down for this slide right so most think about this as the gist of this slide most probable distribution equals to large number of microstates equals to greatest entropy. So what I mean by that is in my earlier figure, if I ask you among the distribution A, B, C, D, E, which one is the most probable, it says that distribution is a large number of microstates, and I'm going to start counting. And distribution C has one, two, three, four, five, six microstates. Since it has the largest number of so that's why distribution C is going to be the most probable distribution and that distribution is also going to have the highest or greatest entropy. All right. So I hope this kind of makes sense. All right. So for the knowledge check seven, what I'm asking you is, Refer to figure 16.8. So go back to figure 16.8, which is this. And I'm asking you number of microstates possible is given by this. So we know the formula, right? So I'm asking you how many microstates are possible if instead of two boxes, like we had here, one box, two box, if I change that to number of boxes to three boxes. And assume that the number of particles is the same. All right, so it shouldn't be that bad. All right, so now if you look at this example, right, on the way to think about the microstate. So if you look at this first picture versus second picture. Right. So again, remember what we had said was the most probable distribution has the largest number of microstates. Right. So we can just think about this as one box. This has another box. Right. One box. This has another box. Now, if you think about this in the first example here, and let's just call this reactant. Let's just call this product. All right. Now. Since there aren't any particles in this box, so you can think about that that as oh, I have only literally one box here, right? That means you are just using one box to put all these particles here. But in this example, where you have the product, I have opened this, and then those particles are divided into two boxes. Right, so that means if you have more boxes, means and the same number of particles, means definitely the more probable distribution is going to be your your product side. And what we had said was more probable distribution means higher entropy, and if you have higher entropy, means yes, definitely. The process is going to be a spontaneous process. All right. Now, if you think about this, right, Louis, let's say if I keep leaving this valve open, do you think there is going to be a time where all these particles or gas molecules are ever going to go to this reactant state? Probably not, right? And that's why I termed this side as 
going from product to react as a non-spontaneous process all right so again some kind of review for you remember what i said told you here was if i have a solid ice in my room temp right now All right. What's going to happen is since my temperature in this room is about 27 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, that ice will definitely melt to liquid water and that process is spontaneous. I don't have to do anything. That 27 degrees Celsius will be sufficient to melt that ice to water. Yes, it might be slow, right? It might take two, three hours if I have a big block of ice. All right. But what about that process? Do you think the process of that liquid water, let's say the liquid water turned to solid. Sorry, the solid water turned to liquid, all the liquid. Do you think that liquid water would ever freeze back to solid ice? No, at 27 degrees Celsius, that is not going to happen. That's why this is my non-spontaneous process, whereas the first one was my spontaneous process. That's what I mean by going from here to here is a spontaneous process. Right, because this has large number of micro steps. Uh, this is the most probable distribution, whereas going to this to this is a non spontaneous process. All right, so now uh, entropy is another state function. This term might be something that you are familiar with. In KM 115, we talked about state function as a function that only depends upon the initial state and the final state. It does not depend upon how you got to your final state. Right? That's how, what our state function is. All right? That means if we find want to find the change in entropy for this state function, we can literally just calculate the final state of the entropy minus the initial state of the entropy because it is a state function. And in K115, you learn that enthalpy is also another example of the state function. Right? Enthalpy H or delta H. Any enthalpy, does that ring a bell? I hope so. All right. So make sure you know the state function and then we can calculate the delta S of the system if we know that S final and then S initial. Into final entropy minus initial entropy. Now let's talk about some of these factors that affect entropy. The first one is the phase of the substance. Example, think about it, look at this picture. So you have three flasks, same material. Let's see if you have a crystalline solid, right? Like salt is a crystalline solid versus liquid versus gas. And then you might have learned about something where solids are more compact and more ordered or relatively ordered compared to liquid, whereas liquid is relatively ordered compared to gas. But do you see how the disorder is the most in gas? And then the disorder is the least in solid and the disorder is in between, in liquid is in between solid and gas. That means what I'm telling you is as you go from solid to liquid to gas, the entropy increases. And that's why let's say for this process going from solid to liquid, the delta S is greater than zero because let's just say entropy of this liquid was five. All right, this is just a random number. I'll try to show you why is that a positive number. All right. Let's say S, let's do six because that S and five look similar. And since I said the entropy of a solid is less than liquid, I'm just going to call that S equals to one. That means if I want to find the delta S of this process of solid liquid, solid going to liquid, I can just subtract S of the liquid minus S of the solid is going to be six minus one equals to plus five. So this is a positive number. That's why delta S is greater than zero. All right, that means always true. Solid going to liquid, the delta S is always greater than zero. It's a positive number. What if I go the other way around? Let's say if I'm trying to freeze that liquid 
back to solid, right? For that process, my delta S is going to be S of solid minus S of liquid equals to S of solid is going to be 1 minus S of liquid is going to be 6 equals to minus 5. And that's what I mean by delta S. So the change in entropy in a process where a liquid is going to a solid is always less than 0. All right, so basically understand this concept as right? to when the last is greater than zero or less than zero for a process of the phase change going from solid to liquid to liquid to gas. So that's the first factor that affects entropy of the substance. All right, so now how does the temperature of the substance affect entropy? So a higher the temperature, higher the kinetic energy, meaning that the molecules or the particles can move much more freedom freely all right if the particle can move much more freely means entropy is definitely higher all right that means in gist so i have to summarize it higher temperature means there is higher entropy and this diagram shows you right so if you get this entropy value on the y-axis and this temperature on the x-axis as the temperature going up the entropy value is going up as well in this graph up 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 now if you're wondering as to why is this sharp right at this point right you see at the, right at this point it's so sharp i need to pause the video and think about what happening here right this process this graph is showing you the this is a solid ice turning into liquid water to vapor gas all right so now as you increase the temperature right you have a solid ice solid now as you increase the temperature what's going to happen is those water molecules in the ice that are trapped they're going to start vibrating right they're going to get some kinetic energy they're going to start vibrating mean that the entropy is going to increase but not as drastically because it's still in solid state now at this point right that's your zero degree celsius or 273.15 kelvin right the solid ice starts changing starts changing to liquid water right now guess what that solid has less entropy than liquid right and that's why as soon as the solid starts to into liquid water that's why the spike here is really high because the solid which has less entropy way less entropy than liquid has turned to liquid or melted and then you have formed all the liquid water here and then you are heating up the liquid water again the entropy increases again at this point but not as drastically and at 100 degrees Celsius or at 373.15 degrees Celsius Kelvin, that's the boiling point of water, that's when the liquid water converts, starts coming to gaseous vapor. And that's why this certain spike in entropy. All right, so that's why <coughs> temperature with increasing temperature, there is increase in entropy as well. Let's look to this LX problem and let's try to answer some of these questions. So you're trying to predict positively how entropy changes with temperature and volume. And then easy way to think about this, right? And also if you think about volume, so let's see if I have a beaker with some gas particle in here. Let's say it's an enclosed container, right? With a piston on top. Now, <coughs> if I let the gas go up a little bit, same number of particles, whatever I have, all right, which one do you think will have <coughs> higher entropy? <coughs> right, so the way to think about this is this one with the greater volume, right? means the gas can move much more freely. And whenever a gas can move much more freely, the entropy is definitely higher. That's why this right here, 
system with the higher volume has a higher entropy, right? So now let's try to answer this question. So the system that we're looking at is a few moles of carbon dioxide gas. All right, so let's just say, uh, we can use this as an example. So let's just say this was by carbon dioxide gas here in this picture, all right? And then the change that was brought about was the carbon dioxide expands from a volume of five liter to a volume of 10 liter, right? So this is said this was five liters. Since the volume expanded double, this is going to be my 10 liters. Since the temperature is held constant, right? Temperature doesn't play a factor in here, all right? And what did I say earlier, right? Then this final state that you're going to reach has a higher entropy than this meaning that the delta f has to be greater than zero All right because remember delta s is equals to s final minus s initial since this s final is going to have a higher number than this initial s that's why delta s is going to be greater than zero a few moles of helium gas the helium is heated from four degrees celsius to 66 degrees celsius so there is an increase in temperature as well as increase in volume, right? That means what did we say? When there's an increase in temperature, entropy increases, as well as when there's increase in volume, entropy increases as well. That means delta S is definitely gonna be zero. Going from here, where you had a few moles of gas, and then you bring this, up, bring up all this change. A few grams of liquid water, this is liquid. And then the water evaporates meaning that you are changing that water to vapor form or gaseous form what did we see about liquid going to gas that process is going to have delta s always greater than zero because the entropy of this gas is higher than the entropy of liquid right and then we looked at this picture to kind of understand that right entropy of this liquid is lower than the entropy of this gas where the gas can much more freely move about that flask compared to liquid, meaning that this is has a higher disorder, higher disorder meaning higher entropy. That's why this process from going from liquid to gas is going to have the gas greater than zero. And so the other two factors that affect uh entropy is the type and number of particles right so if you look at my our formula s equals to k l and w k is a boltzmann constant but w is the number of microstates right and what we had said was microstates formula was w equals to n divided by n where n is the number of box where capital n is the number of particles that means when number of particles increases, this N, capital N increases, so does the entropy. So do you see how these are both are in numerator, right? That means when W increases, S has to increase as well. And W increases when number of particles increases. That's what I mean by this, right? And when I say the type of the particle, that has got to do with the molar mass. Meaning like, let's say if I have the same number of particles, let's say CH4, C2H6, C3H8. Right, so same number of particles. All right. And if I ask you which one has the higher entropy, what you're going to tell me is basically the one with the greater number of atoms, right? So this one has three carbons and eight hydrogens. I mean, yes, they are bonded together to form one molecule, right? But then still, this has much more atom. Much more atoms means they are going to have greater entropy since the number of possible microstates increases with more atoms, right? So in other words, easy way to think about this is if you are comparing similar material, the S increases with an increase in molar mass. 
right? Because molar mass is related to the number of atoms for sure. That's why if they are if you're comparing apples and apples, the molar mass increases as you go down, and that's why the entropy in C3H8 is greater than the entropy in C2H6, which is greater than the entropy in CH4. Finally, the fourth factor that affects entropy is whether it's a pure substance versus mixture. So definitely mixture is going to have higher entropy than a pure substance, which is made up of only one kind of substance, right? So pure substance, you might have learned that in K-115 as pure substance are elements and compounds, right? Let's say if I have a beaker of water, five liter of it, versus if I have five liter of beaker of water and dissolve sodium chloride, five liter NaCl solution. Right, so basically, definitely the one which has a homogeneous mixture is going to have higher entropy than a pure substance where this is only made up of water. And so let's answer this question. It's more about mixing. The first question was. You had a solution made of potassium iron only at water at 70 degrees Celsius, and 50 ml of water was added. So do you see how you increased the amount of water here? Right, that means you added the number of particles went up, meaning this is going to have higher entropy. That's why delta S is greater than zero. All right, next one is you have 20 liters of pure krypton gas. So let's just say you have one tank with krypton gas and you have another tank with helium gas right kr for krypton at for helium then what you do is you take one tank and you mix both of those krypton and helium if the pressure is kept constant and temperature is kept constant since this is also similar to mixing when mixing happens definitely the delta S is always greater than zero. The last one is you have a solution of potassium iodide in water, right? So you have a homogeneous solution. Since so it's dissolving water, right? That's a homogeneous solution. Then what it's saying is some of this Ki it crystallizes out. So let me just draw the Ki with the green. Right? So you're gonna see some solid potassium iodide crystallizing out during the change. Right, so basically think about this way. So you have all the liquid in, in my first case, right? Because the homogeneous solution, then all of a sudden you added our, some solid started forming. And what we had said was the entropy of a solid is less, right? Entropy of solid is less than the entropy of liquid. I mean, definitely this change is going to have less entropy and since this is going to have less entropy, meaning this delta S is going to be less than zero. So higher entropy, less entropy. That's why delta S is going to be zero, because delta S is basically S final minus S initial. So basically now, based on what I just talked about, a couple of LX slides, this is knowledge take eight. All you have to tell me is whether the delta S, the change in entropy of the system is positive or negative that's all of the change if you want to call it right the system the change in entropy of the changes that occurred is either positive or negative for these three processes all right for the room one process one what happens is whenever you take the dry ice from a freezer and put in a room on the dry ice it's solid at negative eight degrees Celsius, and when you allow it to room, want room temperature, this solid starts turning into gas. Basically, process one is basically you have solid carbon dioxide, right, at negative eight degrees Celsius, and the change you're looking at is is changing into in gaseous carbon dioxide. As we have rotated this way, 
which one might be more chemistry like <laughs> gas that's what process one is the other two and three are pretty straightforward so i hope this isn't that bad all right so next concept that we're going to talk about is second and third law of dynamics and what they say so from your came 115 if you remember first law of thermodynamics we said that delta u equals to q plus w right the total energy equals to the heat absorber released plus the work done all right now let's learn about the second and the third law of thermodynamics Right, so people that make sure you're comfortable with this concept system and surroundings is something that we already talked about in k115 so i'm not gonna talk about it too much so easy example in k115 that i said was basically let's say if you have that we that i that, that we used in k115 see if i have a container which is all sealed right and then but then there is a let's say lead up here and then there's some water in here. All right. Let's see if I heat a metal up. And I drop it in the water. And there's no water. And I drop it in the water, the metal. All right. So when that happens, my heating up of the metal right what it does is expands the metal when i put in the water it starts contracting it back again right but then there's going to be some kind of heat exchange between water and the metal and what we say is metal in this process is defined as a system because it is undergoing the physical change all right and because of that physical change it's causing the heat exchange between the metal and the water and that's what we're going to define this. We defined this metal as a system, and then water and the container are everything else as the surrounding. All right, so that's kind of like the system. So here, the difference in the system is the part of the universe that is of specific interest. My specific interest was this metal. That's why I defined that as uh, my system. The surrounding constitutes the rest of the universe outside the system. That means everything else to which that heated metal lost its heat to that we're going to define that as surrounding all right so let's say if we want to figure out whether a process is spontaneous or not we must know the consider the entropy chains of both the entropy of the system and the surrounding all right and how does that work is basically first let me just tell you what the second law of tells, tells you is basically the you all spontaneous changes right cause an increase in the entropy of the universe that means the change in the entropy of universe, if it's greater than zero, means that that process is gonna be a spontaneous process. That's why, that's what the second law of thermodynamics says. You might be wondering, but then how do we find the delta S of the whole universe? Basically, the delta S universe is the sum of the change in entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surrounding. That's how we can figure out the delta S of the universe. And then once we figure out the delta S universe, if that value is greater than one, sorry, greater than zero, or if there's an increase in the entropy of the universe, right? Remember, whenever I say delta S universe is greater than zero means I'm telling you that there is an increase in the entropy of the universe right so for example whenever in our early examples whenever i said delta s was greater than zero what i'm telling you is there is an increase in the entropy of the process in the process right for example 
for these examples, right? So let me erase all this. So whenever I pick this as the answer, what I'm telling you is there is an increase in entropy in this process. Same thing here. Whenever I say delta S of universe is greater than zero, what I'm telling you is it's the same as increase in the entropy of the universe. And that's it. That's what second law of tells you that all spontaneous changes cause an increase in the entropy of the universe, meaning that delta S universe greater than zero will be a spontaneous process. And to figure out delta S universe, we say that's the sum of delta S system plus delta S surrounding. All right, now we said delta S system, a uh, universe has to be positive for spontaneous process, right? Now the question is, if you have a negative delta S system, can it be spontaneous or not? All right, so for that, I'm gonna go back to my formula. And what he's saying is like, okay, let's see if I have a negative number here for my delta S system then will that, or when can that be spontaneous? The only time that delta S system, when it is negative, can be spontaneous is when the delta S surrounding is a positive number and it's bigger than the delta S of system because what's gonna happen is if this is a positive and big number, then negative number here, that means overall when I add these two, I'm gonna get a positive number and that's when delta S universe is a push number greater than zero means the process can be spontaneous even when my delta S system is negative. And so again, remember, whenever I say this, all I'm telling you is the delta S system is negative. Nothing else. Whenever the negative delta S system is written as. So basically, this is something that I already told you in the first slide, right? That means if you have a delta S universe greater than zero, that is going to be a spontaneous process. What about if it's less than zero? Not surprisingly, that's going to be a non-spontaneous process. But remember, what we had said was, if a reaction is spontaneous in the forward reaction, so let's see if I have a reactant going to product. If a reaction is spontaneous in one direction, meaning that going from reactant to product, let's say if it's spontaneous, it must be non-spontaneous in the reverse direction. That means whenever the last universe is greater than zero, <coughs> we said this is gonna be a non-spontaneous process, but guess what? If I'm looking at the reverse direction, that will be a spontaneous process. <clears throat> and finally, this term that we have talked about a lot, is what happens when the delta S universe is equals to zero. Right? That is when the system is at equilibrium. Keep that in mind. Right? So you have a spontaneous process, reactant going to product. Right, a non spontaneous process, meaning that that product would never go back to reactant. And finally, whenever your reactant and product are in equilibrium, that's why I saw the equilibrium arrow, delta S universe will equal to zero. All right, so based on what I just told you, spend my five minutes, useful minutes on this. There's going to be a knowledge check nine. What I've asked you is how can the sign of delta S universe be used to predict the spontaneity of the reaction? And the answer all right here. So it's spontaneous, non spontaneous, or with zero, what is it? All right. Now let's learn, let's use our second law of thermodynamics to predict whether the change that they are talking about is going to be spontaneous or not. All right, so remember, when delta S of universe, is my grading, greater than zero, 
it's gonna be anyway. all right so now the change that they're talking about is two liquids mix neither absorbing nor releasing heat so whenever the two liquids mix what did we see about mixing delta s of system is going to be greater than zero right or a positive number how about that let me start writing the positive number otherwise that might confuse you delta s system is going to be a positive number right because when two liquids mix the entropy increases whenever the entropy increases the delta s has to be a positive number now the second part is going to be really important in determining the delta s of surrounding right because my formula for delta s universe equals to delta s system plus delta s surrounding it is neither absorbing nor releasing heat when that happens the surrounding entropy does not change at all it will be equals to zero all right since the heat was not transferred between the system and the surrounding meaning that if i use the formula delta s universe equals to delta s system versus delta s surrounding i'm going to get a positive number right and when i get a positive number what does that mean than zero it's a spontaneous process change is spontaneous all right so let's get on the one it says a gas condenses to a liquid right so whenever the gas condenses to a liquid the entropy decreases right gas going to liquid entropy decreases meaning that the, the system is going to be a negative number and what they are saying is even during this process neither heat was absorbed nor released to the surrounding that's telling me the delta s surrounding equals to zero my formula for delta universe equals to delta s system plus delta s surrounding which is going to give me a negative number negative number meaning it is not a spontaneous process all right now the last one tells me a chemical reaction between two liquids creates gaseous products whenever liquids produce gaseous product the delta s of system is definitely greater than zero right or a positive number since it's greater than zero because gaseous product has a higher entropy than liquid reactants right but this question for some reason doesn't tell me anything about the delta s of surrounding whether the entropy of the surrounding changed at all this increase did it decrease this information was not provided to me if this information is not provided to me i cannot determine whether the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not because i won't be able to figure out the delta s of universe if i do not know my delta s of surrounding all right so now let's talk about the third law so i hope this second law of thermodynamics makes sense basically the second law of dynamics helps you determine whether a process or change or reaction is going to be spontaneous or not that's what it does and the third law of thermodynamics what does it tell you my third law of thermodynamics okay my notes for third law of thermodynamics right so this is something that i might have brought up when i when i taught you came 115 right this concept of absolute zero this concept of absolute zero refers to the temperature of zero kelvin If you're wondering what is zero Kelvin, all right, that's equivalent to if you convert that to degree Celsius, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Now, if you're wondering how cold is that, all right, the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth was in Russia somewhere somewhere called Vostok station I have no idea where that is never been to Russia which uh, I will be able to go there one day we want to definitely visit that country 
was only minus 89 degrees Celsius. That's the coldest temperature that has ever been recorded on Earth. All right, now we're talking about absolute zero. Zero Kelvin, which is negative 273.15. Look how small that number is, how cold that is. Even the number itself sounds cold to me. All right, so what does my third law of thermodynamics tells me is, so we talked about entropy, right? How this is defined as how disordered a system is, right? And then at room temperature, remember all these solids, liquids, and gas are made up of atoms, right? And then if we just heat up those atoms just a little bit, they'll start vibrating, right? The gas will just go crazy. All right, but at negative 273.15 degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin, what happens is the entropy of a pure perfect crystalline substance will be zero. The entropy is zero at zero Kelvin for a pure crystalline substance. That's it. That's what the third law of thermodynamics tells you. All right. And then there is no lower temperature than zero Kelvin because that's the absolute temperature. And the reason as to why that happens, why there is no entropy <coughs> for a pure crystalline substance at zero Kelvin is because first thing at zero Kelvin, all molecular movement, any vibration that you might have, right? So let's say if there is a molecule A. Right? Remember, this is a bond and there's always this vibration, right? Between these two bonds, electrons, right? Electrons, right? At zero Kelvin, all this molecular movement completely stops. And whenever all these molecular movements completely stops, guess what happens? There's only one way you can arrange the molecule, right? If there's only one way to arrange the molecule, what does that tell me? My formula for S equals to K L N W, right? W refers to the number of microstates. If there's only one way, it means my W is just gonna have value of one. S equals to K L N of one. N of one is gonna be zero. K times zero is gonna be zero. If there's only one possible way to arrange the molecules, it means that entropy at that temperature, which is zero Kelvin, will equal to zero. You know, what? if you're <coughs> wondering what does that uh, entropy zero means, so think about that as a perfectly ordered molecule, right? And then there's only one way to arrange that molecule. That's it. All right. So basically, we talked about it's not absolute. Can you fix that? That should have been a uh, standard entropy. All right. So basically, <clears throat> in Chem 115, we use this term H. Uh, 80 degree, right? Or at not what we're gonna call it, or superscripted O, what we're gonna call it. And we said we can use that H degree, right? If we know the H degree formation of the molecular compound, we can calculate the delta H of the reaction, right? Do you see how we had defined this as the standard enthalpy in K115? And we can do the same thing with molecules, all right? Now this S degree is called the standard entropy of a substance. Now, when I use the term standard, what I'm telling you is basically this condition has to be satisfied, right? That means you have to have only one more substance and you should have done that calculation or done that uh, measurement 
at a pressure of one bar, which is pretty similar or equivalent to one ATM. And finally, at a room temperature of 298 Kelvin, that is kind of equivalent to close to 25 degrees Celsius. So that's what standard is in chemistry. Those are the standard conditions, right? And finally, your concentration, if you have a solution, a quick species, the concentration has to be one molar, meaning that one mole per liter concentration should be used. If you're trying to measure the standard entropy of that particular substance. Now, as to why do we worry about S degree of the standard entropy of substance, guess what? So this is probably reactant, a reactant, a reactants going to a product. Right, so I might have A plus B reactant going to C plus D. Right, now if I want to calculate the entropy change for this reaction of reactant going to product, right, because remember the delta S degree, if I'm able to find that out, I'll be able to find the delta S degree of reaction that will help me figure out the delta S of universe. To find the delta S of universe, I can let people know whether that reaction is spontaneous or not, right? Now to find the standard entropy change, I can figure it out if I know the standard entropy value of all of this substance. If I know the standard entropy value of substance C, if I know the standard entropy value for D, A and B, if what I can figure out the data as degree of reaction. All right, and we'll get there in a couple of slides. We're going to see what's the formula to figure out the delta S degree of reaction. But first, let's look at some of the standard entropy values of some of these substances. And let's try to make a sense of these, all these numbers. All right, I'm not asking you to memorize these numbers. I'm asking you to understand the trend that you see in these. The first thing that you should have noticed is, remember, in our first factor, we, I talked about that FX entropy. One was the phase of the substance, right? And we said that as you go from solid, liquid to gas, the entropy increases, right? Entropy increases. And look at that easy example that you see here, right? Let's look at water liquid versus gas liquid. Liquid gas versus water gas. That sounds weird water in liquid form versus water in gaseous form, right? And we said that the one for gas has to have a higher entropy and look at that number. Not surprisingly, the value for standard entropy for liquid gaseous water is 18.71, whereas for liquid water is 69.91. All right, now the only thing that you are going to notice, notice is something that I told you earlier, right? If you look at these three numbers, CS4, C2S4, and C2S6, right? Those are similar in nature. And then if you look at this factor that I talked about earlier, right? For number three, what we have said is if they are similar, All right, and let's assume that they have the same number of particles, meaning that the same number of molecules of CS4, C2, S6, and C3H8, right? What we can do is we can count the number of atoms for each of these, and then the one with the more number of atoms will have higher entropy, right? In other words, the one with the higher molar mass will have the higher entropy, All right? And that's what you see here. If you think about this example over here, these numbers, Look at this CS4. And remember, all of them have to be the same same phase. All of these are in gas phase, but since C2H6 has higher number of atoms in one molecule, that's why its entropy number, standard entropy is higher than C2H4, which is higher than CS4. Right? On the example is these two, right? So do you see that how these are so similar? Words, words, but then look at this number of atoms in CS3 or C2S5, and that's why you see that increase in number. All right, so look at this slide, and hopefully it makes sense to you. The other good example is comparing carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Not surprisingly, the entropy goes up as well. 
in this. All right, so for your knowledge safe pin, all I'm asking you is something that I already talked to you about. Look at the standard interview values of gases, CS4, C2S4, and C2S6, and I'm asking you about the trend that you see. Finally, look at the general trend of the, in the standard values of soil, liquid, and gas, which I already talked about, and I'm asking you what do you notice for the standard entropy values as you go from a solid liquid to gas. So I told you, okay, we need to know this standard entropy value because it helps us figure out the delta S degree of the reaction change in entropy for a particular reaction. And this is something that you might have seen in KM 115, right? That means the change in enthalpy of a reaction can be figured out if you know the enthalpy formation, standard enthalpy formation of products, as well as the standard enthalpy formation of the reactants. Right now, if you look at the, the STD formula for a reaction, change in standard enthalpy, sorry, entropy of a reaction, look at that, how similar they are. Right. Something to keep in mind, all right? I haven't written this term N here. That refers to the coefficient because we do, remember, we do include the coefficients whenever we use this formula. And I'm going to work out a problem based on that concept. Do not worry about it, all right? But then let's learn how to use this. I will right, we'll right here. It says, remember to multiply the standard entropy and standard enthalpy formation by the coefficients of the balanced reaction when we use this formula. Right. All right, so let's learn to use the standard entropy of the product and the reactant to figure out the delta S degree, the standard reaction entropy, or the standard entropy of the reaction, all right? Delta S degree equals to what of this reaction is what we're trying to figure out. All right, so now for this, it tells you you have the Alex data tab for this that will give you the S degree of all these reactants and products. So the S degree value for H2. Well, the reaction has been given as 130.7 joules per Kelvin mole, or mole Kelvin, whatever you want to call it. S degree for, I'm just going to write it up there in blue. I'll change it, but S degree for other reactant, L2O3, has been given to me as 50.9 joules per Kelvin mole. Then my product. S degree for aluminum has been given to me as 28.3 per Kelvin mole. And finally, the S degree for water, but then in the gaseous form. Remember, make sure you watch out for the phase of all these substances because it makes a heck of a difference, right? Because if you look at this, look at this water. In its liquid form, it has a standard entropy of 69.91, whereas in its gaseous form, it's 180.71. Okay. And that's why this is in the gas form of water. That's why it is 188.8 joules per Kelvin mole. Right? All my standard entropies of the all my reactants and products have been given to me. Now, all I'm going to do is use that formula, right? The formula that has been given to me here. So, my formula down, delta S degree equals to summation of. Now, right now, to make sure that uh, I include the coefficients, I'm going to start writing the formula as N product, all right? Of the S degree products minus summation of 
and are the number of moles of the reactants s degree of reactants all right so remember this is the same problem over here all i did was i made sure that i added these coefficients so that you do not forget to write that down all right now all i'm doing is plugging my values so first let's focus on the product my product is what i'm going to focus on right so i'm going to add all those values to so start with aluminum i have two mole of these two mole of aluminum right and then the entropy standard entropy value for aluminum has been given to me at 28.3 my unit i'm just going to write for one of them that we can see how the moles and moles gets cancelled out right joules per moles kelvin right so aluminum done now I have to look go for under product, right? Because I have to sum all the products up. My under product is water. So three times I've started removing the moles, right? Because what's gonna happen is this mole and mole is cancelled. My final unit for the delta S degree of reaction is gonna be in juice per Kelvin. Going back to my other product, I have three of the water. Let me just put a big bracket here. And then water has the value of 188.8. All right, I'm gonna close this bracket because I'm done with my reactants. Now I'm gonna to go to my products. For my products, now I'm gonna erase these values because I think you already have these. For my product, the green minus my first product is aluminum, there's only one mole of it, so one time. Standard entropy value for aluminum oxide has been given to me at 50.9 plus my other product is hydrogen. I have three mole of those, and then value for that is 130.7. All right, so all I have to do is add these two numbers, then add these two numbers, subtract those two. I will be I'll end up with 180. What's the units again? Joules per Kelvin. Because you see how I've shown here mole and mole gets cancelled. That means the only unit left is joules per Kelvin. Right. So that is the change in the entropy whenever aluminum oxide solid reacts with hydrogen to give me aluminum solid and water gas. Right. So what does this tell me? That means what does this number tell me? I want you to start thinking about this conceptually. All right. It's basically the entropy increases as you go from reactant to product. Right. Now, if you want to think about this, we can directly look at this reaction. Right. Really going to be important because there's going to be Alex homework based on this, and we can even before I solve for this. I can literally kind of guess whether the change in entropy is going to be positive or negative. So let's look at back to my reaction. So I'm going to erase all these numbers. <clears throat> all right. Remember, my number that I got was plus 180, which is a delta S is a positive number, or which is greater than zero, whichever you want to way you want to think about it, right? Whenever you have a positive 180 number. All right, now let's look at this reaction and let's figure out whether the delta S should have been. Let's say I didn't know this number, and if I ask you, is the delta S for this reaction going to be positive or negative? All right. So, first thing to think about this, right, is basically whenever you have solid substance in the reaction, just disregard it. The solid has a very, very less entropy value, right, which you saw it here. Look at these numbers, they are so small. All right. Then I'm going to go to my gaseous or liquid substance guy out there. I do have it. I have three hydrogen in here and three water in here. And what did we say about that? We have three. First thing is the number of particles is the same. All right. So three hydrogen versus three water. Same number of particles. 
that means it doesn't matter. But look at this, I have hydrogen here versus H2O. Which one is gonna have higher entropy? I mean, you can go back and look at the number here, but you don't you have to go here, right? What did we say earlier? If you have similar looking substances, right? Well, do you see how this water has extra oxygen? Or in other words, higher molar mass? It means definitely this water gas is going to have higher entropy. Right, that means that's telling me that this product side has a higher entropy than the reactant side. That means the chain delta S, if remember, is always product minus reactant, right? or S final minus S initial. My S final was my product. Since this has a higher value, that's why delta S is definitely going to be a positive number, right? Or delta S is greater than zero, which is what we see here. Right, when I did all the calculations based on the entropy, standard entropy, standard molar entropy value, I see that the delta S is a positive number. So I'm gonna end this lecture right here. And today by 5 p.m., I will go ahead, or at least give me to 6 p.m. because sorry, 2 p.m. I do have to think about the K1 video lecture as well. By 6 p.m. today, I will upload the video for tomorrow as well. The reason being eCampus is going to be down for four days. So I just want to make sure you have access to the video materials which you can download. Keep that in mind. All these videos that I have made created on eCampus to Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, you can download those videos. All right, so tomorrow, since the game is going to be down, make sure you download the videos if you don't have time to watch the video that I'll be uploading for tomorrow by 6 p.m. today. All right, all right.